Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Hi, thanks for joining us as we continue in our series regarding questions about God and faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening and this time that we share together. May you encourage our hearts and bless us. May you teach us through the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And may we come away with a greater understanding and appreciation for just how much you love us. For these are the things we pray for in Jesus' precious name. Amen. One of the questions that I get often from individuals is, how can I change my life? Well, the reality is, is that most people are incapable of changing their life. I mean, you can, you can change your education. You can change <clears throat> some of the elements of your training and development. Uh, you can go through a class and you can read self-help books and so forth like that. But to really change your life, in the capacity of what they're referring to is how can I be a better Christian? How can I be more like Jesus? <clears throat> Willpower is not going to cut it for those type of things. The reality is that God is the one who needs to change us. And so you ask yourself the question, well then how does God change us? Well, God changes us any number of ways. Sometimes he just changes us through his word. We, we hear his word, we we're able to understand and apply it, and it affects us greatly, and we're able to be changed in that way. Sometimes we're changed through prayer. Many changes in life take place on our knees, or someone else on their knees for us. But God changes us more often than not through the circumstances of life. 
He molds and shapes us into the image of His Son. In Romans chapter 8, it says that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And so often there are circumstances in our life, uh, many of them painful, that bring us to a point where we are pliable. We're able to change, and God uses those things in our life to change us. I want to talk to you today and use an example from the life of Jacob in the Old Testament. Now, Jacob was a twin. Uh, He and his twin brother Esau had grown up in the household of Isaac. And as they got older, uh, God had revealed to uh, Jacob's mother that he was going to be the one who would gain the Uh, respect and be the patriarch of the family after Isaac died. But Esau had been born just seconds earlier. As a matter of fact, Esau stuck his foot out and then Jacob was born and then Esau was born. So you could kind of argue it either way. Anyway, there was a, a little bit of a crisis there in that situation. Esau was not a man of God. He was not a spiritually minded man. But both of these boys were big. They were, they were recorded as being big men. And uh, I look at Jacob in the scripture and I try to visualize what would Jacob be like. I often look at individuals and I'll try to picture what they might be like. I refer to Jacob as the Hoss Cartwright of the Bible. <laughs> I just look at him that way. He was a big man. He was certainly capable and able to take care of himself. It's been demonstrated a couple of different places in the scriptures. <clears throat> And so he was a big man. He was able to um, get out there with the best of him, but he was not a brawler. He was not a fighter. It's not his nature. It's not who he was. He was certainly capable, but that was not in his personality. Well, the Bible tells a story of how that Jacob actually stole the birthright from his brother Esau by fooling his father, uh, putting a fake a hairy arm thing on him to make him feel like his brother's arm. And Jacob passed, I mean, excuse me, Isaac passed the blessing of the birthright on to Jacob. And then when he realized he had been fooled, uh, he still did not take it back. He left it with Jacob. But Jacob, under the counsel of his mother, left, went to find a wife. And of course, he got two wives, Rachel and Leah, in the bargain of it all. But finally, he left that place where he had met his two wives and he was traveling back down through the land and he knew he was going by where his brother was. And he assumed there was horrible, terrible animosity and there was a bitterness. There would be a war between them. So Jacob made the decision to send a group of his servants ahead with many of his flock as a peace offering, a blessing, a gift unto his brother. And then after that, he sent the remainder of his herds. He sent his family across, and then he remained there alone. So he did not go out in front to meet his brother. Uh, You can speculate all you want. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe this, maybe that. It doesn't make any difference. God used this occasion for something good in his life. Jacob's life was about to change. He was about to go through a transformation that was God-initiated. So when I look at Jacob's life, and I want to understand how it is that he changes us, uh, first of all, if we look at this example of Jacob in the Scriptures, it begins with a crisis. You see, Jacob was in this situation where he was afraid of war. He was afraid he was going to be attacked. He was afraid that he was going to lose all that he had gained over the many years that he had been building a herd up and and been preparing and and his family was there with him, his two wives and his children were there. He was concerned about all those things. But he had sent them on across this brook and then he waited there during the night by himself until he would pass over and see what had transpired in his absence. Well, the scripture says, so Jacob was left alone. And he was just there resting, sleeping, maybe had on his uh, outer garment around him, which was the custom during that day. And the Bible says a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, we know that this man was, in fact, what we call 
a Christophany or a Theophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ, that Jesus actually came and struggled with this man. Now, he had to be pretty big guy and strong <coughs> to be able to withstand the Lord. But the scripture says they wrestled until daybreak. And when the man saw he could not overpower him, the Bible says he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and he, as he wrestled with him. In other words, he, he knocked his hip out of socket so that he would have this debilitation while they were wrestling. Now, before I go on and tell you the rest of the story, let's look and try to understand why God uses a crisis. Sometimes, you know, God uses a crisis to get our attention. How many of y'all can testify to that? Yes, I wasn't walking with the Lord. I wasn't doing right. And then a crisis came along and suddenly he got my attention. That's exactly why he does it, because we don't pay attention. So sometimes he uses things to get our attention. I love the story of eagles. I have studied eagles for years and even did a whole series on the life of an eagle. But one of the things that happens in the life of a young eagle, which is a tercel, they're ready to start flying. They should be out flying, but they've lived in this comfort of the nest. It's been lined with soft things. Their toys are there. Everything is present. And then when the mother decides that it's time for them to get out of their nest and get out and fly, she does the oddest thing. She comes in there and she starts throwing out all the toys and they're going, wait, what's going on? That was my toy, you know? And then, and then she takes all of the soft stuff that was in there and she starts throwing that out. She waves her wing. He sweeps it all away. And the little ones are probably there and they're probably screaming to dad, mom's gone crazy, dad, please help us. What's happening? And uh, in, the, in the last moment, she takes one of them and she just throws them out of the nest. Will they die? No. Dad's there to catch them when they start to fall. But sometimes they're just able to open their wings and fly because you see they're capable of flying, but they don't know it yet. Sometimes God brings a crisis into our life so that we realize we can be that person that God intended us to be. And he uses those moments of crisis in our life in order to help us become exactly what it was he created us to be. He gets our attention. And there's probably not a person that's a Christian for any length of time that's listening to me tonight that hasn't experienced that. God got my attention through something. And he uses it to get our attention. And here's the other reason. We resist change in our lives until the pain is greater than our fear. We do that. We're afraid of change. We will resist change until the pain is greater than our fear. And so, what are you going to do? He creates a crisis in your life. Here's what happened with Jacob. It started with a crisis, but God's ultimate goal is commitment. God pursues a commitment in our lives, and that's exactly what was transpiring with Jacob. See, Jacob had been kind of running away, running away from God, running away from responsibility, running away from uh, the situation with his brother. He had been running away, and God wanted to change him. He wanted him to become what he had intended for him to become, which was the one who would carry on the lineage through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and finally Jacob. It wasn't Esau that God was going to use. It wasn't Esau that God chose. But you see, we look at Jacob's life and he didn't fully comprehend or understand that. He had the birthright, but that didn't mean anything to him. He was now a wealthy man by his own standards. And so he had built all that he had. And now he was coming back to this situation. But he still wasn't committed to God. And that's what it was going to take. God pursues a commitment from us. He doesn't want us to be wishy-washy or halfway. He wants us to be fully committed. Romans 1, Romans 12, excuse me, in verse 1 says, 
uh, that we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, which is our reasonable worship, our reasonable service before him. God wants all of us. And so he pursues a commitment from us. You made a commitment when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but he wants more. He wants you to be fully committed to him. And that's exactly what was taking place here with Jacob. In this continuing narrative in verse 26, it says, Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He wanted to be blessed. Now that word blessing, barach in the Hebrew, literally means to bestow upon favor. So he wants a favor. He wants uh, a bestowment of favor. He realized this was no natural struggle. This was a supernatural struggle. And, and Jacob said, I want to be blessed by you before you go. He may have wanted the hip to be put back in socket, but that would not be the case. And so we, we look at this and he pursues commitment. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why does God wait? Why does he wait until this all transpires? God often waits to see if we mean business. Jacob had to struggle with God all night long. There's been times in my life where I struggled with God for months and months. Uh, maybe you have too. Some people struggle for years or even decades. But God waits often to see if we really mean business. And I'll tell you why. Because as human beings, we are great starters at things. But we're a lousy finishers. <laughs> How many times have you made a New Year's resolution and it just fell by the wayside? Probably every year. We do this. We're great starters, but we're lousy finishers. And so why does God wait? God often waits to see if we mean business, but also we often miss out on God's best because we quit. Now, this is not a matter of willpower. This is a matter of surrender. I surrender my life. I surrender all to you. Oh, we miss out on God's best because we just quit. We give up. We don't, we don't pursue commitment in any way, shape, or form. Galatians 6 and verse 9 says, And let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Don't quit. Don't give up. Just keep going. He pursues commitment in your life and in mine. So how does God change us? First of all, he often starts with a crisis. Secondly, he pursues commitment from us. Jacob reached out and said, I'm not going to let go until I receive your blessing. I'm not going to quit this until I see the victory. I'm, going to, I'm not going to quit until you give me what you promised to give me. And so uh, you and I have to look at that. God pursues a commitment from us, and he wants us to demonstrate that we're committed and not give up. And then the third thing, not only does God start with a crisis and he pursues commitment, but he also asks for a confession. Now, when you and I confess, the scripture often says many places, you know, confess. Uh, by the way, to confess something means to admit. Uh, you see, God already knows. Confess our sins. You know, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. The word confession literally translates into I agree. That's what it means. I agree. Confession is an agreement with God. You think he doesn't already know your sin? He doesn't already know the shortcomings in your life? He knows them all. The only thing you're doing is agreeing with him. Yes, Lord, this is a problem. Yes, this is me. Yes, this is, this is the sin. This is the way I am. He just wants you to agree with him that you need to know your condition. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God asked him, the Lord Jesus actually came and walked in the cool of evening and said, Adam, where are you? And he asked that question, not because he didn't know where Adam was. He knew where Adam was. The problem was Adam didn't know where he was. And very soon he recognized where he was. He was in a place of sin and failure and guilt and shame. That's where he was. So confession 
is agreeing with God. God wants a confession from us. And so when the man, when Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, here is the odd reply. <laughs> the man asked him, what is your name? Now, did Jesus know what his name was? Yes. But Jacob need to own his name. Jacob. Now, this is important. Jacob means cheater, a usurper. He was someone who cheated someone else out of something. And God said, what's your name? My name's Jacob. Let me ask you, what's your name? Is it temper? Is it worry wart? What is your name? Is it lust or guilt or depressed or greedy or, or resentful? What is your name? Because it's a reflection of your character. And you say, well, that's not my name. No, but it is your character. And one of the things we have to do is we have to understand who we are. Who am I? Not in Christ, but just who I am I. I know that I'm a child of the King, but you need to look at your life from the perspective that Jesus was asking Jacob, who are you? What is your name? And he realized at that moment, I'm a cheater. I'm not one who is committed. I'm not one who is faithful. Why does God, you know, want a confession from us? Well, to change, we have to stop making excuses. We have to stop passing the buck. We have to stop running away from our responsibilities for our own sin and failure. Too many times people make excuses. They don't own up to who they are. They acknowledge who they are. You know, I, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. There's nothing special about me. I'm just a sinful man whom God poured out his love on simply because I admitted who I was. And you see, until you admit who you are, you'll never know the wonder of what God can make you be. <clears throat> God wants to change you. And he wants to often bring us to a point where he will pursue a commitment with us. If it takes a crisis to do that, then he's willing to do that. Uh, he wants us to confess, to acknowledge, to agree with Him where we are in our spiritual life. You know, the Bible says, as the Scripture teaches us, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Now, that term grace, charis in the Greek, means a free gift. It's a free gift. God gives us His grace, a free gift. What was it that Jacob asked for, he said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Give me that blessing, that favor. Bestow it upon me as a gift. Well, God resists proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then finally, often God starts with a crisis, but he always pursues our commitment. He always asks for a confession. And then fourthly and lastly, he rewards our cooperation. When you look at the remainder of this story, it's such a beautiful thing. In verses 28 to 30, the man said, here's, and here's the blessing, by the way, <laughs> your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. He changed his name to Israel, which would eventually become the name of the nation that God had born out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so his name was changed that day. He experienced a transformation. It was not just a transformation externally, not just a name change, but a heart change. And the name Israel means Prince of God. You are the Prince of God. Before he was a cheater, a usurper. Now his name has been changed to a Prince of God. And he says, why? Because you have struggled with God and with men, and have overcome. And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Peniel means the face of God, saying, It is because I saw God 
face to face. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You look into the life of Jacob and you realize that he received the blessing of God. His name was changed to Israel, the Prince of God. And a beautiful, beautiful experience. But he was left with a reminder. Jacob was left with a limp for the rest of his life. Jacob's limp was a reminder. Sometimes you and I have gone through difficult circumstances in life in which God changed us. It may be a crisis that we had to go through, but God changed us. But we still carry with us the scars or the pain of that. But nonetheless, God blessed us. Jacob's limp was a constant reminder of four things. Number one, that we are to depend on God and not on our own willpower to change us. You see, your willpower may be good for a few minutes, but it, it just goes away after a while. Our willpower cannot sustain us, but God can sustain us. God makes the changes in our life permanent. He changes us from the inside out. And we're to depend on God to change, not on us. So, dear friend, if you want to know how to change your life, ask God to change you. But be willing to go through that process. Be willing to face a crisis if that's necessary. More likely, pursue a commitment. God wants you to be committed to Him. He wants your confession. He wants to acknowledge who you are and where you are. And if you'll cooperate with Him, He will reward that cooperation. So Jacob's limp, first of all, was a reminder that we're to depend on God and not ourselves for the power to change. Secondly, the things we resist will only persist. Did you know that? Willpower won't work, so the things we resist will only persist. The things you try to try to uh, just put out there and say, no, 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 it'll continue to persist in your life. You want victory over something? If you resist it continually, it'll only persist. Jacob's limp was a reminder that we never solve our problems by running from them. He had run for too long, and God made him aware that running from this situation and running from your problems is never going to solve them. And then, finally, the things we face, He will replace. You, you don't have to stay the same, dear friend. You don't have to continually be downtrodden by your sin. You don't have to constantly live in guilt or fear. You don't have to live up to your name, so to speak, which is your reputation that you have. You don't have to do any of those things. I've seen those that had a reputation of a bad temper become gentle, precious souls. I've seen those that were worry worts become victors. I've seen those that were consumed with lust to be filled with presence of God's love. I've seen those that lived in guilt suddenly hold their head up high in forgiveness and honor. I've seen those that were depressed, no longer so, but filled with joy. Those who are greedy, now generous. And I've seen those that were resentful to forgive. God can change who you are. The things we face, He will replace. And so it's important for us to bear that in mind. Ephesians 4, 22 and 23 says, Put off the old man and put on the new, which is created in the likeness of God. You and I can put off that old and put on the new, but He's the one who's going to do it. We have to depend on Him. And He will change us for the things we face. He will replace. I'm going to give you a, a, a closing word here. Dear friend, Satan is not the one who wants to change you. He likes you just the way you are. Uncommitted, halfway, struggling in your spiritual walk in life. Hey, Satan don't want to change you. He likes you just the way you are. God is the one who wants to change you. Let him start changing you, dear friend. It begins with a commitment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for your many wonderful blessings. 
May you encourage each heart today. Those that are struggling and who desire change, Lord, give them that change. Lord, I don't wish a crisis upon them, but I pray that they would find that level of commitment, that they would begin to confess their sin before you and acknowledge who they are, just to agree with you. And that, Lord, they would begin to cooperate with you. They would begin to take your yoke upon them. For you have given us a yoke that is easy and light. And I pray that they would begin to grasp that and understand it, that they would begin to allow you to work in their life in the most wonderful of ways. Dear friend, maybe you're here uh, listening tonight and you don't know for certain if you died that you'd go to heaven, but you'll want to know. That's why we're here. We want you to know Jesus. The scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord and believe in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, they shall be saved. And so we want you to experience that forgiveness of sin, the promise of a home in heaven. If you're willing to do that, you're willing to pray a prayer with me this evening, would you do that? Just bow your head where you are and just join me in prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sin. I don't want to feel guilty or ashamed anymore. I want to know that I am forgiven. So, Lord Jesus, I place my faith and my future in your hands, believing that you died on the cross for me and that you shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin. And I believe also that when they took you down from that cross, they laid you in a borrowed tomb. But three days later, you gloriously and majestically rose from the dead so that I can have a home in heaven with you. And, and I want to have that home in heaven with you. So, Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior to forgive me, to wash me white as snow, to take away all my guilt and shame? Will you be my Lord to lead me, to guide me to make good decisions, to be wise in the decisions that I make? And will you be my friend to walk with me, to encourage me and help me, and one day walk the streets of heaven with you? And I praise you and thank you for saving me. And dear one, if you did pray that and you meant it with all of your heart, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what the scripture says. God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. It's important. Let somebody know uh, that you accepted Jesus. If you don't have anyone that you can share that with, you can drop me a note there, Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com, and I'd love to hear from you. Dear friends, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being a part of the ministry at Family of God Community Church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you. And as we leave this time together this evening, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As always, dear friends, keep looking up. <laughs>